Hi, welcome to my product school presentation from product manager to product advisor, monetizing your product management skills. My name is Jamela Holder and I am a newly full-time product advisor. And in today's presentation, I wanna share with you not only a little bit about my journey to getting to be a product advisor, but also um, some of the things you can consider as you possibly look into doing this full-time or on the side as a side hustle for yourself. With that, I'll give you a little bit about me. I am a second generation independent advisor. My father has been consulting um, small businesses and medium sized businesses for decades now. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial family and also went to work with him sometimes um, on the client site. I have a 15 plus year career that's pretty expansive and varied across different disciplines. Um, six to seven years as a product manager, four years in operations, five years in finance, two years as a chief of staff to the COO for North America at SAP. Um, I've done both enterprise and consumer product management, um, as well as I'm a former product leader at SAP and LinkedIn. I have an MBA from the FICWA School of Business at Duke University, um, and I enthusiastically coach people into switching careers into product management or just getting them interview ready, regardless of the discipline and industry that they may be entering into. So for today's agenda, um, a couple of things that I thought would be great for us to cover would be around what's the difference between fractional product manager and a product advisor. There is some difference between the two. And I realized that the rise of the fractional sort of role across the various disciplines um, has, be, has become popular over the last like maybe a year or two. Um, why a startup would want to hire a product advisor, the skills that are required, the activities that I do, um, the benefits, challenges, and risks of doing this role, discussing more around proposals and pricing, um, and then how you can get started. So with that, um, so there are a couple of key differences, I'd say, between fractional PM and a product advisor. So a fractional product manager is um, a product manager that comes on, you know, not quite full time, but offers X amount of hours per week. So they are kind of repeat coming back to the client and um, and working with that client week over week. Because of that, they are a bit more ingrained in the actual culture of the company. They also work a lot more closely with the engineering and the other cross-functional teams. Um, and they're actually seen as part of the team, but also because it's a lot more of an ongoing relationship, they have higher ownership of the product, meaning that they're there for longer. They might be, um, you know, working across a number of different products at a startup specifically, um, or they're solving more complex problems because they are there for longer. Um, so a product advisor is someone who comes in on more of a consulting background background, um, looks at a scope of work and identifies what that is. Um, they aren't as implementation focused, or they can be, but they don't have to be, right? It's really up to you as to what your scope of work looks like. And I'll get into um, where I've kind of carved out my own niche uh, with this, um, but it is more project-based work. They are not necessarily um, as ingrained in like the team setting and the team culture, uh, they may or may not be attending daily standups. Um, so they do have a shorter term uh, outlook with regards to the work that they're doing um, and delivering value very, very quickly um, is extremely important for a product advisor. And it's also important for a fractional PM, but the product advisor is there for a short time. So they have to be really impactful, um, basically right out the gate. Um, and they may also offer additional skill sets, uh, such as coaching and operations. That's actually what I'm doing. I'm not only doing product advisory, I'm also doing um, operations, sales, business processes, uh, advisory, um, and executive coaching as well. Now, between these two roles, um, you are using your established PM skills. So if you've been in product management um, for a number of years now, then you already have some baseline understanding effort an understanding and effort around how to do product management successfully at another company. So you can 
think about doing something like this fractionally as a product manager or a product advisor. Um, neither of these roles are permanent employees, which means they do not have access to health benefits. Um, it's really more on a contract sort of basis. Um, you may be working with multiple clients at the same time. Uh, and so that allows for you to determine how many clients you work with at the time. And it also allows for you to have more work flexibility. Um, I haven't been consulting face-to-face. -face. I have been taking all of my meetings via Zoom um, for the most part, I should say. Uh, there's a lot more flexibility around what your hours are, right? Because you are working for yourself and in that way, um, are you working during the day? If you are, you know, actually employed within a corporate America sort of setting, you're likely not working during the day. You might be getting this done like late at night or um, first thing in the morning before you have to log on to do your full-time role. Um, in this role, I've also found that uh, these individuals work extremely closely with the CEO uh, and the founder of the company. Um, and so you are advising and, and giving some recommendations around what needs to be done, but you're also um, using your executive presence to communicate uh, very clearly and rather frequently with the CEO or founder of the company that you would be advising. So I want to also talk to you about like, why would a startup need a product advisor? Now, I believe that a startup that's in the early stages would need a product advisor for a number of different reasons. And this is what I have been testing over um, the course of the last two years. Uh, so for myself, what I found is that a lot of founders or the CEOs of their startups in the early stages, especially, and they're still acting as a product manager, meaning they're not only the CEO responsible for the entire company, they're also making the product decisions. They might also be writing the product requirements doc. Um, obviously that's not necessarily where they should be focusing their efforts. So they would be looking for someone like my background and possibly your background, someone who has experience doing product management to support them and lead them in the right direction. Um, some of these founders are, you know, not necessarily at the point where they're ready to hire a full-time product manager because that can be expensive. Um, the more employees you hire, the, the more the, um, the more uh, expensive things can get for an early stage company who is looking at their burn rate. And so with that, hiring an advisor allows for them to get a lot of value all in one shot, setting things up, whether it's a roadmap, product strategy, product vision, but not necessarily have to extend the full benefits of someone that would be um, you know, a full-time hire. Um, but they are also looking for expertise, right? So the CEO and founder has gotten the company to whatever stage they're at. Perhaps they're at the point where they've raised a seed round, or perhaps they're at the point where they are raising Series A, or maybe they've been invested in a Series A stage, and they are really looking for someone to take them to the next level, especially once they've actually, um, you know, had an injection of cash. And they now know they now need to be able to prove the growth of that company. What do they do? They might be looking for people to join them fractionally or a product advisor to help them get set up to make the right strategic decisions that are going to help them grow the product and then grow the company overall. Um, so they might also need someone to come in and help them create a roadmap that attracts VC investment later down the line. Um, or as a CEO and founder, perhaps they've already identified a specific user problem. And while they don't have capacity to solve this problem, um, nor may they have the expertise to solve this user problem um, from a product management lens, you do. And so that's why they might also be looking for um, a product advisor. And last but not least, they may also be experimenting with how they hire as they grow. Um, they may be wanting to take people on fractionally or in an advisory capacity and then see how things work out and then possibly convert those people to full-time hires. Um, so there's a lot of wiggle room, I'd say, especially in an early stage startup that has not hired a product manager or a chief product officer yet. 
um, to allow for someone with a product background to serve in an advisory capacity um, or to be a fractional product manager um, to allow for that CEO to let go of the reins of being the product manager and allow for someone with more expertise to handle the entire product vision, strategy, roadmap, um, and all of those other things that come along with doing the product management role. So these are a number of skills um, that I have been using over the course of me starting to do my advisory work. Um, and why don't I tell you how I got here? Uh, so a couple of years ago, I moved to Miami from the Bay Area and um, Miami has been a great place for me to meet a lot of different people. Uh, but I started going to tech networking events and I would meet either a founder or a funder. Um, and I was neither at the time. And so my thought was, how do I add value to this growing community? Miami is um, having a bit of a renaissance, let's say maybe a tech renaissance where they are attracting a lot of investments by way of um, funders moving to Miami, um, VCs moving to Miami, they're attracting a lot of larger corporations in tech moving to Miami, and then a lot of people like myself who work in tech already and are moving from a number of other um, cities and states across the country. So as I was going to these events, I would have conversations with more and more founders and tell them, hey, I'm a product manager. And they're like, oh, wow, I need someone with your skill set because I'm making all of these decisions. So I initially started um, just by volunteering. I'd volunteer an hour, 45 minutes, help them make a couple of strategic decisions, ask a number of different questions, build my network of people that I knew in Miami uh, and start to just really flex a different sort of muscle that was more in the advisory capacity than it was in me uh, sitting down and writing out all of their product requirements documents and, and having a much more formal relationship with these founders. But as I was doing this work, I realized that I really enjoyed it. Um, it is dynamic work. I'm using all of these different product management skills. I am strategically thinking about not only their organization as I get up to speed really, really quickly, but I'm also helping them prioritize things. Oftentimes I'm working with the CEO, the founder of the company, and you know they're asking me questions and I'm asking them questions and we're brainstorming together around where they are today and what they like to do in the future with regards to growing their company and how the product is going to help fuel that growth. So sometimes I've done just very brief sort of road mapping deliverable items for these founders. I've communicated a ton with them. I've done some data analysis. And so these are a number of the different skills that we already um, use within our product management roles that are now really applicable to advisory work. Um, and it's been stuff that I really enjoy doing. Other skills that I've also used has been my coaching skills, um, sales, business development, really more so around selling yourself, right? I am selling a scope of work to a client, which would be the CEO, founder, C-suite executive at a startup. I am helping them understand what value I'm bringing to the table. And it does require me to put on a bit of a different hat in terms of not just selling my product vision, but selling essentially my expertise as well. Um, I've become better at negotiating things, um, terms, proposals, rates, that sort of thing with um, founders. And I've also been using uh, my executive presence skills in terms of the way I communicate, what is most important for the founder, CEO, or C-suite level to know. Um, and then also been being able to handle ambiguity um, throughout the working process of working with startups who um, you know, are very fluid. In the startup world, things happen really quickly, and you might need to be able to shift and pivot and possibly even advise a founder as they're going through a number of, um, of other things that they might be dealing with in their day-to-day -day operations that have nothing to do with product. So for me, in my uh, current capacity, I'm not only advising on product, I'm also coaching, I'm also advising on how to set up um, scalable and sustainable business processes so that as the company grows, they don't need to reassess these processes later on. So I think there are a number of things that a product advisor does. I've touched on some of them. One key thing is that you are partnering with the founder and the C-suite 
um, at these startups, I'm also asking a lot of questions, gathering background knowledge really, really quickly to not only put together a proposal or a statement of work, but I'm also asking a lot of questions to help me understand how it is that leadership at this startup conducts themselves, how they make decisions. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later, but I think that as you're doing this work, asking a number of questions up front can save you a bit of a headache because you will be able to determine the type of founder you want to work with um, and the type of founder that may not be the right match for you or the, or the right fit for you or the type of culture at the startup that may not be the right fit for you. Um, so I'm asking a lot of questions up front and we're having like really great conversation, but I'm also documenting a lot of this conversation, not only for myself, but for my clients so that they know how, um, you know, we've been spending our time together and what they can expect in the future. Um, and then I start applying my expertise. Once we've come to an agreement around what the proposal should be, what the scope of work is, and I'm very, very um, prescriptive around what are the activities that I am going to be doing uh, in that scope of work and in that proposal. The next is let's get started, right? So some of the things I've done before has been analyzing qualitative and quantitative data. I actually ended up taking a data analysis course earlier this year for about 10 weeks so that I could um, become more well-versed on data analysis as I haven't necessarily had to um, do data analysis as much. Um, working at LinkedIn, we have data scientists. So I got uh, I got a little uh, lax, let's say, with my data analysis skills. Um, so I took a data analysis course and was able to refresh myself on how to pull SQL reports, if it is that a startup is going to need me to do that. Um, I also refreshed on how to actually analyze data, how to format data, um, how to present data and make great presentations with the data that I have and, and how to kind of create a data plan. So I refreshed on that specific skill because I realized that in the startup world, um, I may have access to data if the startup has already been collecting that data and I will probably need to be the person that analyzes that data and comes up with some insights. Um, I'm also applying expertise by way of identifying and defining user problems, um, creating the product strategy vision. Again, many of these things are things that we do as a product manager already that are applicable in a product advisory role. Um, where I actually start to stop and do my handoff as a product advisor is that I'm writing the product requirements docs. And while I am having conversations with the engineers, what I'm not doing is necessarily sticking around for the implementation, meaning I'm not joining daily standups um, on behalf of my clients acting as a product manager in that capacity and joining all of these calls on a daily basis. What I might do is write these product requirements documents and interface and interact with the engineers as I'm writing the documents and then give a handoff and then possibly come back in for like one week, um, one hour a week or so where the engineers can, you know, ask me questions live or they might just shoot me an email and just say, hey, I had a question about this requirement or how would you like to handle this? So I keep the relationship um, not as in depth where I'm now working with this company like weeks and weeks and weeks at a time, you know, 10 hours a week or something like that. But what I do is I set things up so that I've written everything rather clearly. I've brought the engineers along with me as I'm writing these documents um, and as I'm thinking through what the strategy is. Uh, and so by the time I'm doing my handoff, they don't need as much direction from me. Um, and that's just kind of how I've set things up for myself. But again, I think the product advisory role is what you make it and it can be very fluid. And so last but not least, we're here to deliver immense value. We're here to deliver that value really quickly. So I create success metrics um, and then I create dashboards that allow for um, the CEO, founder and others to track the progress of whatever I've outlined. Um, and then I would check in after the project has been completed and ask them how things are going and see where they might need additional support. Perhaps now that we've gotten the product to a good place, they might need support with the business processes and the operations. Um, so I am 
not only delivering value really quickly by way of a written product, but I'm also um, allowing for myself to have uh, some touch points with the company after to um, just let them know that it's not a complete handoff or a one and done, and that I am here to support them um, as they implement any work that I do or even bounce ideas off of as well. So why might you pursue product advisory? Um, so you already have these product management skills. And, you know, I realized that by having these skills, you know, you may be thinking like, how would I possibly get started or why would I want to do this? Um, it is a way to monetize the skill set that you've already created for yourself um, and create another stream of income if you're full-time employed um, at a um, in corporate America right now. Uh, I'd also say that if you're in between work, um, perhaps you've been um, laid off more recently, then doing your own product advisory is one way to at least have some other sort of income and still keep your, your, um, your skills sharp while also test driving startups before joining uh, one full time, if that's even something you'd want to consider. So there are a lot of benefits and challenges and risks um, some of which I have outlined here uh, that I'd like to share with you. So there's definitely a benefit around income potential. You're not capped in terms of, um, you know, how much income you can generate. But I also think that, you know, depending on if you're doing this full time or part time or you're kind of just trying to figure out what the right model for you is, um, there's a lot of flexibility in this role. I'm very disciplined about how I spend my day, how I spend my week. And in fact, at the end of the week, I start to check off like how much of my time did I spend on marketing? How much of my time did I spend on actually getting the work done? How much of my time did I spend on the networking aspect of things? So there's a lot of flexibility with this role um, where sometimes I might take you know, uh, a couple hours off in the morning to go do some other stuff and then get down into the weeds of the business um, later on in the day. Uh, or, you know, I can work from wherever I want to work from. My, most of these clients don't necessarily feel like they need to see me in person to know that the work is getting done. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility with that too in terms of how I spend my time, just have to get the work done. Um, I'm also solving a variety of problems across different industries. So I've been blessed to be able to work with founders across education, um, technology, fintech, uh, and I actually have a background in financial services. So that was a really cool project for me to work on. Um, I've also worked in like the life event space. So what happens when um, someone unfortunately passes away and what are some of the products and services that serve that um, industry? Uh, so I'm solving problems and challenges across a variety of different industries. Um, and I think that's actually one of the most exciting parts of doing this is that I'm not just solving one problem day in and day out. I am looking at how I can solve problems across a variety of different areas. And as a product manager with a really great skill set around how to build great products, I feel very confident that I can ask some questions and get into the weeds really, really quickly and then help myself to understand and orient what it means to solve problems across these different industries and then apply my product management expertise to that. I've also been building a really wide tech, ne tech network of founders and others um, as I've been doing this. Um, and that's been really helpful because um, sometimes the founders will ask me, hey, do you know someone that does this or do you know someone that does that? And because I've been building this network over time, um, I'm able to advise them on people that they can possibly hire or have conversations with. And last but not least, you can also possibly transition to a startup that you've advised. Um, I don't know how long I'll be doing this. I'm really, really enjoying uh, this part of the journey and this part of the ride right now. Um, and perhaps success for me looks like doing this for a next year or two. And then I find a really great startup that I've not only been advising that I'd want to join and I join in some sort of full-time capacity. Um, this really is what you make it in terms of how you structure your advisory practice, um, the type of offerings and service offerings that you have, as well as um, you know what level of enjoyment you get out of some of this. 
Now, in terms of the challenges, and these are just inherent challenges of being an entrepreneur, I am constantly building a pipeline, which means I am going to a lot of networking events. I'm going to a number of conferences. I might be prospecting on um, LinkedIn and finding different founders to reach out to. So business development and sales is somewhat of not necessarily a challenge. I realized what it is and what it takes in order to do this. Um, and I, I noted it as a challenge because I realized like not all of us have that skill set of doing business development and sales. I've been developing this skill set over time, and now I feel really confident about doing business development and sales on behalf of myself. And it's actually something that I really enjoy doing because really a lot of it is just talking and asking questions and getting to know people and what are some of their biggest pain points in their business and then figuring out if you're the right person to support them as they're doing this. Um, another challenge can be accurately pricing your services. You know, you might want to get into doing an hourly rate or doing a package rate or, or something of that nature. And you need to be able to not only accurately price your services, but then also understand, um, you know, how many hours it's going to take you to complete a scope of work. And so you need to have a really good sense of what that looks like so that you're not pricing, you're not under, underbidding yourself, essentially, um, which could happen if you're not really thoughtful around how long it would take you to get a scope of work done. And then assessing founders and startups potential. Um, you know, not every founder is going to be someone that you gel with, uh, just given personalities, what their working style might look like. The culture at the startup might be, um, you know, not necessarily what you'd want to sign up for. So with that, I, when I'm meeting founders, I have kind of an intake with them and I have a conversation with them around how well do they make decisions? Are they able to make decisions quickly or are they trying to drag things out? Right. Um, you know, how is it that they want to be communicated with? Are they going to be calling me every hour or are they going to allow me to do my work and then allow me to come back to them and say, hey, here's what I have in terms of recommendations or here's what the scope of work is that I'm this is where I'm at right now. Uh, let's meet so that you understand how I'm maneuvering through working on this scope of work for you. So there's a lot to consider when you are working with founders or sweet, sweet executives in this capacity. And then some considerations and some risks. Um, if you are full-time at your corporate job, you may have signed an employment agreement. Uh, and with that, that um, this may be in conflict with that. So that's something that you might want to know. Um, the income could be variable depending on how you're building the pipeline and how well you're doing the business development and the sales. So that's obviously something to keep in mind as well. Um, you need to be able to manage your time effectively and, and understand how much time it will take for you to do specific tasks. You also need to be able to recognize when it feels like there's project scope creep. Let's say you've agreed to a certain scope of work and now the CEO is saying, hey, but I'd also like this. Well, you might want to revisit the payment and the amount of hours that you're giving to that founder to get the scope of work done. Um, so just understanding what that looks like. Um, I'd also say another thing to consider would be that, you know, as you're doing this work, especially if the startup is very, very early stage, perhaps you do, you act in an, an advisory capacity and then they want to offer you a board seat a little bit later on. So um, that could always be a, a really great thing where you're now advising in a different sort of capacity um, as being part of the board of a startup that you feel has potential. Pricing and proposals. Uh, so the monetization aspect of things. So um, the way in which I've started to work with my clients has been around hourly rate pricing, but understanding the full scope of work of the project. So if someone gives me a scope of work and I have documented it in the proposal that I'm sending out, what I will do is say like, hey, here's my hourly rate, considering the 15 plus years um, in business that I've been working and experience that I have, um, specifically what it is that you're asking me to do and what we're agreeing upon. And here are the number, estimated number of hours that I believe it will take to get this project done. Um, so I had mentioned earlier that I would do data analysis. Well, I'm very upfront with the founder um, of the company in my proposal. Like, hey, if you're giving me data in kind of like broken format, meaning like data from all over that I have to now piece together, that I have to now format, that I have to now make sure um, 
is formatted correctly, you are paying me now to format this data, right? But if you're giving me data in a format that doesn't require me to do so much reformatting, then I can just get straight to work. So I am actually including assumptions within my proposal around what state what the state of data might look like so that as i get into the data analysis piece i'm not spending three hours of my time trying to reformat data or trying to find the data because they don't have like the best access to it so my hourly rate and pricing is more so around um you know my experience what my time costs on an hourly basis and then i am also giving a scope of work and saying like here are the four key activities and deliverables that I am going to be doing. Um, and here are the number of hours for each of these four deliverables and give them sort of an estimate around how much this scope of work will cost them. So we're coming to an agreement based upon that. Um, there's also just like flat rate project-based pricing where you can just say, hey, for this project, this is what I charge. Um, with that there are some risks right because perhaps you realize that you may have underbid yourself so there's opportunity here to create the pricing structure that you want i've also encountered founders who want to offer me equity perhaps because the cash flow and the burn rate is of major concern to them in that moment um, and so with the equity offering, there are a number of other risks there, right? Because now you really have to evaluate not only the leadership of that startup, but the actual opportunity that is ahead of them in terms of what is their problem statement? What are they trying to solve? You are in some ways acting like a VC, right? Like what is the product that they um, are launching? Like you're evaluating them kind of on the same terms that a VC might evaluate them to determine if they want to invest in their company. Um, to determine if this is in your best interest, right? Because startups come and go. And so if you're taking an equity offering for a startup that you don't have full and complete confidence in is a good idea, you don't have full and complete confidence in the leadership, then this may not be worth much. And you may have given up cash to get an equity offering um, when you're doing this work instead. So there are opportunities here, but you have to weigh how much cash versus equity you'd want um, and depending on where the company is and what stage they're at, they may or may not offer you an equity stake. They may just want to be able to pay you in cash instead. So as I'm doing these proposals, um, I'm creating really descriptive proposals. I'm documenting the conversations that we've had, what we've learned, what I believe the problems are that are within the business and not just within the product area. Uh, again, because I'm also selling operations, um, process, process improvement, um, uh, experience and expertise as well. So my proposals are always geared towards what is this founder going to get? How should they feel when I'm done, right? What sort of transformative experience are they going to walk away with um, having once I've completed my scope of work with them? So I'm constantly describing to them how I'm creating value for them um, and what the end result should look like in order to uh, help them envision what working with me looks like and what sort of state and outcome they can expect when they're done. So get started. How do we get start started, right? How do you sell your skill set? How do you build a client pipeline? Um, you can assess all of your skills, whatever is on your resume today, assess that, right? Think more thoroughly around what sort of value have you created in your current product management role, or just in terms of your entire career, because maybe you shifted from product management from like business operations. That's a whole other wonderful skill set that you can use to monetize. So understand what your unique value proposition is and have a short pitch that you can share with founders and VCs as you're possibly getting into this work um, and create collateral for your business. So your LinkedIn, your resume, website, what have you, so that people can find you and get a better understanding as to the type of work that you do. Um, I'm constantly talking to people, founders, funders, whomever, honestly, uh, and networking with people and going to different events. Um, but that's just my nature. That's how I enjoy doing some of this work. Um, and then obviously determining competitive pricing based upon your experience. But how do you build a client pipeline? 
obviously networking with founders is one really great way to do this. Um, this may or may not be for you. You may not actually like advising, right? And maybe you're like, hey, this isn't my lane. Let me stay in my lane and continue doing product management in corporate. And that's fine too. One way to get started is actually how I got started, volunteering with startups. I never thought that I would be doing this. That's not even why I set out to volunteer to begin with. It was just, I kept meeting more and more founders that were like, I could use your help. Do you have time for a 45 minute call? And I'm like, absolutely. But here I am now working for myself, doing some of the same things that I started out doing as a volunteer. So if you're able to set aside a couple of hours when you meet founders, speak with them, ask them a couple of questions and then volunteer. They never turn you down, especially if you have product management experience, because it's very likely they are not only the product manager, they're the CEO, they are the sales executive, they are the person creating the operations at their company. And so they could definitely use a different viewpoint on how to create great products within um, you know, their startups so that it attracts investment, so that they're able to grow their company. So schedule short advisory calls with founders and just see how it goes. You can also complete a freelance project with a defined scope of work um, just to kind of test the waters a bit and see if this is something that you would even enjoy and want to do. But I'd say the easiest, lowest hanging fruit that you can do would literally be to volunteer with startups. Um, and then depending on how you want to build this out, if this is something you want to pursue, you can also then go to pitching to VCs as a PM in residence, let's say, or um, you can talk to VCs and say, hey, I'd love to volunteer with your um, portfolio companies. Do you have a couple of founders that are pretty early stage that you think might benefit from having um, someone with my skill set and expertise? That's actually how I started as well. So I started initially volunteering one on one with founders, and then I got the bright idea to start talking to VCs instead. And those VCs introduced me to their portfolio companies. So there's just a lot of ways that you can go about building out your own advisory practice and putting your expertise um, to good use outside of maybe your full-time job. Or again, if you've been impacted by a layoff recently, it's really, there's no overhead here. There's just time. There's just time that's, you know, that's being used here. So there's opportunity for all of us, I think, as product managers to share this expertise that we do have more broadly with founders so that they are now able to um, get the value and all of this goodness that you already inherently possess. So with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming to my presentation today. Um, thank you for joining me uh, to learn more about how you can monetize your own product management skill set. If you'd like to follow my journey, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I am posting more about what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, um, with the hope of inspiring others to you know, create another stream of income for yourself or possibly make a transition if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, and I can be found on LinkedIn. Thanks once more. Um, hope everything uh, was to your liking. And um, yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn.